folks. Nine. Good morning. Our December office hour. Just kind of a heads up. This is an office hour that our team hosts every first Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. We also record these office hours so that we can have them on our website. So if you happen to miss the office hour, we try to include any new information that we've received during the month from the US Department of Ed. We also try to highlight, maybe if there's been a repeated question, we try to highlight those repeated questions here in this office hour. So thank you for joining us. We know that it, the sun is shining out, but some of you may not have power. We had a, a storm last evening and I hope everybody is safe and well. So thank you for joining us. As you folks may know, my name is Shelley Shassi Jandro. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. Um, Monique is looking at her notes, but she's next in line, and there she is. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got distracted by, um, by an email. Um, my name is Monique Sullivan, and I am the ARP coordinator. I'm Karen Kuziak. I coordinate CARES, which is ending, and CRISA or SORSA, some people say, and also some special or small projects uh, within ESSER. Good morning. I'm Kevin Harrington, and I'm the GEAR and EANS coordinator. Good morning. I am Mai Shasha. I am the fiscal coordinator. Good morning. I'm Robert Palmer, and I am the procurement analyst for EANS. Good morning. I'm Deanna Roberge. I am the management analyst for ESER funds. Good morning, I'm Rebecca Mitchell and I'm also one of the management analysts. And we have another teammate, Terry Beal, who's unable to attend this morning, but she is one of our contract invoice reviewers. So if you're on the business side or the fiscal side of the house of all of this work, you may receive emails from, from DD, Rebecca or Terry. So today we're just going to highlight a couple things in regards to um, information that we have highlighted here. So some of the topics we're going to discuss is maintenance of equity and the December data and the statutory requirements associated with that. May pertain to some of you, may not pertain to others. Our CARES liquidation, since we are in that time frame, we'll talk about that. We also have uh, maintenance of equity data requirements. So again, thinking about that December data and what we need to be sure that we have available on our website. We would also encourage all of you folks to update your contact information. We do have some additional information about subscriptions and how we as a team are going to process to align and streamline with the department as a whole. Then we'll provide you a quick update on our multilingual and students experiencing homelessness application. I know we've received an increase of questions in the last month or so about that Subgrant opportunity. We just want to highlight some information for you folks. As always, our goal of these office hours and the objective is to be sure we provide information so that you folks can use ESER funds effectively and align with the federal requirements. So this chart, I'm sure, is quite familiar to those of you who attend regularly mm -hmm. our office hours, uh, but there have been three streams of funds, CARES, CARISA, as I call it, and ARP, or SR1, 2, and 3. Um, I think if you've been working here for the last few months, you know that September, working in schools and with funds in the last three months, you know that the CARES funds <laughs> needed to have been obligated <clears throat> at the end of last September. And that reimbursement requests must be into us by absolutely December 30th. Now, the, we sent notices out uh, really strongly encouraging you to get those invoice requests in by today, December 1st. Uh, and a couple of people have written and said, oh, can I send all of my invoices for the, you know, the, the you know, months at a time? And our answer now to meet that uh, December 1st deadline. And our answer is no, we still need to have you do three months at a time. But we're going to turn those around really quickly. The analysts here have on priority, their priority list are uh, re reviewing and getting back in touch with you or if they cannot approve immediately, but getting right back in touch with you if there's a concern about it, the CARES um, app, uh, invoice request. So that's a priority for us. We're going to return them right around. And if you're in that situation where you know you have like nine months to invoice for send it in batches of three, three months, three months, three months. We'll try to turn it around and we really aim to get it done by December 30th, but don't delay on the other hand. 
So we're in the, in other words, we're in the liquidation period for CARES Easter 1. And if you need the definition for what we mean by liquidation, it's right in the um, federal rules. Uh, drawing down an expenditure of funds by the grantee for obligations incurred during the grant's legal obligation period, which means before September 30th, 2022, in the case of CARES. Timely liquidation occurs during the legal obligation period on and through the first 120 days after the final day of that period. So that's what the federal government says is 120 days. As you know, we've extended Maine's timeline. So you have a little bit more time uh, because DAFs requires, DAFs, which is our uh, financial and administrative services uh, office in, in Maine state government, they're requiring some time to also um, work with the funds and, and invoice you. So um, those are, and, and uh, again, you've been received, if you're in a, if you are in an SAU that has any remaining CARES funds as of the middle of November, just before Thanksgiving break, I sent emails to each one of those districts, even if it was just $12.92 that was left in Easter one, letting you know that you had that amount still available and encouraging you to invoice for it. And again, uh, the main sense of the equity requirement, this is for the, the SAUs that did not have an exception, so they were not accepted. And um, the bottom of this slide shows that there are about 38 um, districts or SAUs that did not have an exception, and therefore they have to meet MO equity. And we're, you know, want to let people know that um, this information is going to be compiled. We're actually working on it right now as we speak. We're looking at the data that was submitted to us from these uh, uh, SAUs at the bottom of the slide. Um, there was a, a survey that they had to complete by last week. We're reviewing those um, that data. We're compiling it, and these are this is the information that we have to post on um, the OFERPS website by the end of this month, December 31st. Um, so if you can just, you know, if you, this is some of the things you have, we have to identify the LEAs that are high poverty um, in schools, the per pupil amount of funding for each of those high poverty schools. We only have to do, uh, we have to do FY21 and FY22 because FY22 is compared to FY21. The per pupil amount of funding in the aggregate for all the schools, um, and then the per pupil of FTE for all, for um, the high poverty schools and also for the aggregate. And then at the end, we have um, we have to indicate if the LEA did not meet um, equity or maintain equity for the high poverty schools. We'll have to do this again for FY23. So we'll be doing the same thing next year at this time. Um, but for this year, it's only FY22. And we have provide we've been providing a lot of technical assistance to these SAUs and providing as much support as possible because MO equity is um, is an expectation to be met for um, both FY22 and FY23. And we've been getting questions about, do we have to post this information from SAUs? Do we have to post the information that gets posted on the OFORPS website is a requirement. We have to do that. Uh, but SAUs, it's not a requirement for them to post this information, but the guidance is saying that SAUs are encouraged to make the ammo equity data uh, publicly available on their websites to ensure that parents, families, and communities, stakeholder groups know how um, the SAU is maintaining equity for their high poverty schools. And all this information is in the FAQ document. We referenced it to page 23, um, and it's also on our website. We have that MO Equity FAQ document on the OFARP website. So we talked about um, on the onset of the hour, making sure that your contact information in GEMS is updated. We also want to plug making sure that your contact information is also updated in NEO. So two things to think about when it comes to the GEMS system in particular. One is every application, CARES, Carissa, ARP, computer science, um, multilingual and students experiencing homelessness, every application has an application setup page, which you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen. And those application updates 
are really important because what happens is if you are in a process of needing the superintendent to certify, the system pulls the information directly from this application setup page. So if you happen to have a superintendent that is no longer with the district and you're working on sending information to them, they will not get the, the email because this application setup page has not been updated. The other thing to keep in mind is all of the information on the application setup page is used within our GEMS email list. So when we send out a newsletter or any updates that we do directly from the GEMS system, it goes to the first highlighted email, so it goes to the superintendent, and then it also goes to the LEA contact, which we refer to as kind of the applicant coordinator. So when we're using the GEM system, if we're sending out information through that GEM system, like our monthly newsletters, the individuals listed here on this application setup page are the individuals who are going to be getting the information. If this page has not been updated, that information is going into the black hole of that former person's email. So be sure that you're updating the applications. And we understand that there's a number of applications within GEMS that may need to be updated, but I think that's a wonderful thing to start incorporating when you have new applicant coordinators and when you are up, when you have a change in leadership in particular. The other component is to change the system as a whole. So as we know, there's one username and password for the applicant coordinator and there's one username and password for the business manager, both sides of the house within GEMS. So if the applicant coordinator used to be Shelly, and now it's going to be um, Monique or Karen, they can go in and they can update that username and password. It seems a little bizarre to make the connection of the applicant coordinator to the federal grant reimbursement system, which is FGRS. However, that's where that information is logged. So you can go to the federal grant reimbursement system and there's an account tab within that federal grant reimbursement system where you can update that information if you are the applicant coordinator and that information has changed. Again, you wanna do it in both locations because both locations are used for a particular reason. So we have some step-by-step -step instructions on our website and I'll ask one of our teammates to grab that link and throw it in the chat box um, so that you have it. Again, we use the GEMS portal as our main tool of communication. So if we do not have the updated information, we do not, we cannot confirm that you folks are getting the information that you need. So as Shelly mentioned um, earlier, to streamline our in-house subscription process and also to make the reimbursement process a little easier for our districts, we made some recent changes in our subscription process. So going forward, any services covering multiple fiscal years, such as warranties, maintenance plans, and uh, software subscriptions must be prorated and can only be charged to federal funds for the cost amount during a grants period of allowability. So that remains the same. The change is it does not have to be prorated by the fiscal years going forward. So we try to uh, include two examples for you. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see there is a subscription cost that starts from October 20, October 31st, 2022 till October 30th, 2023. So if it is requested under ESA 2, it needs to be prorated since the subscription date exceeds the grants period of allowability, which is September 30th, 2023. And uh, Below, we just tried to show you how you can prorate it. You can divide the total cost amount by 12 months because it's a 12 month period cost and then multiply that per month cost by 11 months and can submit that cost amount uh, under ESA 2. 
So uh, that th 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 this $1,787.50 um, is the amount that can be only reimbursable under ESA 2 because that is the cost amount from October 31st, 2022 till September 30th, 2022. And on the right hand side, we are showing you another example where you can see the licenses, different license costs. And the license period is from July uh, 2022 till July 2023, which is within the period of allowability. So in, the, in such cases, you don't have to prorate the subscription cost or license cost. So in the next slide, we will see some guidelines when we have to prorate, when we don't have to. So um, cost for licenses, subscriptions are included in the receipts in various ways. And whether it requires to be prorated or not will depend on how it is presented in the receipt. So in the cases, if um, it is a license that is included in the purchase price, so it is not itemized out with the length of the license, it does not need to be prorated. It can be approved as a part of the product purchased. So if not bound by time, like two or three years subscription period, the payment can be processed if it is requested as purchase services. The reason for that is if there is no time uh, associated with that subscription, there is no way we can prorate it because there is no um, concrete time to align to, uh, the prorate to. For perpetual licenses, the same. If you do not need to, uh, you do not need to return the devices at the end of the ESA program. You don't have to prorate it, and. Uh, in the cases when a new version of the software comes out before the ESER program is over, you need to prorate that cost if you decide to purchase the new uh, software program. Didi, you're muted. Can you unmute Didi? Didi? There, sorry about that. I didn't realize I was still muted. Um, so additional funding to support the needs of students actively experiencing homelessness and or multilingual learners who have been impacted by the pandemic. And you can view specific SAU allocations on our website, and the link is, is right there. Um, application is available on 4pcamain.org. The subgrant funding can cover unexpected expenses incurred to support students experiencing homelessness and or multilingual learners related to preventing, preparing for, or responding to COVID to the COVID-19 pandemic from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2023. More information on this is also available at the link provided for you to be able to go in and, and uh, look at all that information that's needed there. It's, and if your SAU has an allocation but will not be participating in this subgrant, please indicate so on the application. We've included a slide with additional resources. So there's the ESSER page, the EANS page, uh, the use of funds, uh, facts and questions, and then the Maine's Federal Emergency Relief Programs page as well. Um, you can find a lot of really helpful information on these sites. We also have an office hour the first Thursday of every month at 9 a.m. 
We've included the registration link. Uh, it's a hyperlink, so you just click on it and um, you can come and join us every Thursday. Um, if you have any specific questions, you can always reach out to us in advance and we can include that um, in as well. And then along with our office hours, we actually have a monthly newsletter that goes out and it does get sent to those email addresses like Shelly was stating. So it is important to have all your information updated so that you can get the most accurate information. Um, but both the newsletters and the office hours are published on our website. So you can go back to them. So now we're just gonna open up the floor and see if there's any questions that we haven't addressed. We've been monitoring the chat box and there's been no questions in the chat box, but just wanna be sure that you have a captive audience of our team and anything that you may have been curious about, we're able to, to address at this time. 